the program will be a good introduction for them, but it's Emily Sable and I'm sorry again. Janetta Sanford. Janetta. And Emily is executive director of Home Inc. for how many years now? Uh, seven. Seven. Let's say I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary. And Janetta is a AmeriCorps uh, employee. Uh, and they both live in town. Yellow Springs, oh me. Ready? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious to know what uh, made everyone, mm -hmm. if you can pull it, pull it up. Well, get it, your, uh... What made everyone want to talk about housing and pick that as a theme for this association? If anyone wants to weigh in. I know we live here. It's important. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Thank you, guys. Yes. Oh, no, no. Uh, well, affordability has been one of the. I mean, I've only been involved for two or three years, but you folks have had two major studies after the 2000 census, after the 2010 census, mm -hmm. comparing cost of living here to other towns of similar size in the region, not necessarily market competitors like Oakwood or wherever. Uh, in any case, there's been a constant drumbeat about affordability, and that includes housing. Great. And access. Those of us who live here have some real interest in terms of um, how do we contact homemaking. We're interested in purchasing, renting, uh, availability, that sort of thing. Sure. Well, um, we will have a slide at, at the end with our website, but that's the best way is to go onto our website or to call. And our website is yshome.org. Okay. And our phone number is 767-2790. And we're in the Red Book also. And, and as soon as, oh, I was going to say, and I put my cards up there too with that information. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, we have some flyers and cards up here. Yes. As a member of, of several boards of trustees I'm, for nonprofits, I'm very interested in, in your request to have the village subsidize you because we would like to be subsidized. Absolutely. Yeah. We will have a discussion time <laughs> sure. afterwards. Okay. And Missy, please. Um, I guess I'm. Con well, I, I want to know. I'm, I want to be educated on what you're doing, but I'm curious in these little housing areas or the area near the um, fire station, the breakdown of low-income average housing and then those people who would qualify or are interested in market value facilities. Um, because I think there's a real need um, just even with the general population as we age to move into some kind of safer, more appropriate housing. Sure. And we'll, we'll have a, a slide that talks specifically about that right. site once, once the PowerPoint gets going. Um, yes? I would like to hear more about senior citizens in the uh, housing. We hear a lot about the young couples with young children and helping with the school, but we also don't hear, I don't hear that much about senior citizens uh, using the home homes. We will talk about that today. Okay. Absolutely. And I'm writing all this down too. Does anyone else have a particular topic or theme that they would like us to address? Yes. Kind of piggybacking on a couple of things that were said. Uh, Homing's definition or explanation of affordability as it uh, relates to low income and seniors on fixed incomes as well. Affordability does not necessarily mean availability for low income fixed income. Okay. Yes, Janetta. Yeah, I curious as to what the process is for somebody who's you know, buying one of these things. I see one of them up for sale for 122000 and sort of just curious about what they can sell it for and what the price, the new price would be. Uh, and to whom? It's sold and to, to whom? How long it's going to stay at $122,000 in the house in Yellowstone? Yeah. 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 
And do they actually own the land or just the building? Sure. Um, so I'm writing all of this down and I'll, I'll work to address all of these questions and then at the end if I miss something we'll go back to the notes and make sure we covered it. But we'll, we'll cover that too because there's an overview of the homeownership program. Okay, I would be interested in him knowing as well as, as, as far as improvements go, when, once you purchase a home, what improvements that the owner is able to do to the land or the home and um, you know, what they would need to have permission from home to do. Sure, that's a great question. That's, a, that's sort of a national conversation around the community land trust too, or these uh, improvement versus capital uh, improvement policies, you know, when you're, should, what kind of credit should you get for an improvement that um, increases the appraised value of the home? Okay. <coughs> yes? This is more, the, turn off the front lights there, or because it's kind of Okay, of course. Certainly. Yes. John, can you? All right, there you go. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Good job. Good looking out. Peace be teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you need any help to get the PowerPoint set up? Going okay so far. Let's see. Okay, so so far I've heard about um, who are the home incomes affordable to and, ter and how does that relate to uh, area median income, um, income diversity and it, you know how are we filling various gaps from low income to market rate um, in terms of providing safer housing, senior uh, housing for seniors, the process for buying and selling, improvement policies, and uh, how we make homes available. Did I miss any topics? I would like to know if there's been a survey done to determine how much affordable housing we have in Yellow Springs, and um, if so, what percentage of our total housing is that? Well, um, my understanding is that there are approximately 75 Green Metropolitan Housing Authority units, and we have 22 units. But, but there are a lot of houses, very small houses, on the streets like um, <coughs> Ridgecrest and um, some, some other streets in town. Yeah, that uh, would certainly qualify as affordable housing because of their pricing. Yeah, but a barrier to affordability is also the shape that the house is in. And so if you have to go in and put in fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to bring it up, then that creates a barrier to affordability. Yeah, I understand that, but I don't think that we can assume that all of them are not livable in. Well, we have some specific data from the market study to share with you, and a few slides in. And I hope that it answers your question, and if it doesn't, we can have more of a discussion at the end about that particularly. <coughs> Let's start it off from the beginning. All you're wonderful. <laughs> um, and then just do a, a I, the notes probably shouldn't show, just go up to slideshow at the top. Mm -hmm. On the little, here we go. Press the F5 key. Good there we go. All right. Okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody. I'm Emily Seifel, Executive Director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And my mentor, our founding director, Marianne McQueen, is here also. Um, so thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your questions. And if you have any trouble hearing us or questions as we go, feel free to ask. Um, and then if, if there are too many questions, we can hold them till the end. But um, the first thing I wanted to point out is that every photo in the presentation is from our program. So you'll see faces, some people you may know, some people you may not, but just know they're all from our program. This is Brianna McCowan, and she lives on Cemetery Street. Um, 
I'm also here with Kenetta Sanford, a new resident in town who with her husband John and their daughter Nora just purchased a house on Dayton Street and we're very happy to have her uh, join our team at Home Inc. Um, so this is our mission. This is a little drawing by Rudy May who also lives on Cemetery Street. Um, and we got started, some of you in the room were, I'm sure, remember when Home Inc. was founded. Uh, Don Hollister played a key role. Uh, as I understand it from looking at our articles of incorporation um, in actually founding the organization. Um, but my understanding is that we got started after a couple of decades of concern over rising housing costs. And what would that do to Yellow Springs? Would we become a bedroom community? Would we displace residents? Would we lose some of the income diversity that makes us a strong um, democratic community? Um, and so they're a village Council Housing Task Force was established. We have another one today. Um, and I believe that Don, feel free to weigh in, uh, was one of the folks that researched different strategies for how to create and preserve these community assets of lasting, long-term, permanently affordable housing um, in limited markets. And they recommended, after a lot of research, the creation of a community land trust, which is what led to uh, Home Inc being founded. I would actually give Mary Ann the Community Land Trust credit. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Ann. Joseph Hebbets and Suze Plaza, I think, are the people that most promote it. Um, you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think this is an important slide because it shows some of the impact that we've had in the market here in Yellow Springs. Um, we are what's called a community stabilization strategy. A lot of times when people hear affordable housing, they think about neighborhoods in Springfield or Dayton that might need a lot of investment um, to bring up property values. The other side of that coin, though, from a public policy standpoint, is stabilizing a, a community <coughs> that is strong. Because otherwise you're just pushing poverty from place to place and it's important for the future of Yellow Springs, um, we believe, and, and the founders of Home Inc. believe, to make sure that we had um, a community where everyone could belong and participate um, and we did the gap between um, you know, what the market will sustain and what people can afford would grow larger and larger. Um, most of the affordability funds that we've raised and invested into permanently affordable housing in Yellow Springs have come from outside the community. And I think that's important to note that this is a key strategy for economic development in town. And we're doing things that the market cannot do in terms of creating access to housing in Yellow Springs. Um, so we've invested nearly $4 million. We have a uh, project right now that's over a $1 million now under construction on Dayton Street. Um, we've had 10 resales. We didn't need additional subsidy for any of them to keep the homes affordable to people of low income. And because most of the sellers went on to purchase market rate housing. So that the strategy has worked in our community for 20 years. We've never had a foreclosure. Community land trusts are very good at supporting homeowners to prevent foreclosure post-purchase. Um, so we're able to to step in when times get really tough and we have some financial um, uh, flexibility in terms of helping people go, you know, move on to a safe landing uh, to protect that public investment. Um, and then also, I think there's a myth in the community that because we're a nonprofit, home and homeowners don't pay property taxes and that's not true. Uh, this is a key economic development strategy. So the, the homing portfolio generates over $60,000 a year most of which goes to support local schools. Um, and so our strategy is very much in line with creating additional fair access to housing, but also improving and stabilizing our tax base as an economic development strategy. So we have uh, completed more than 20 or 22 units with six down under construction, and our, the home suite of homes currently houses more than 60 residents in the community. Um, and then we also have financial coaching services that are really pretty high level, um, individualized coaching, 
setting financial goals, getting ready to become a homeowner, um, learning about mortgages, and recently we actually became certified to package low interest mortgages in house. So we've been able to, to reach a number of families beyond the homes that we're constructing. Um, and then I think probably what we're most proud of is again, the um, not a single foreclosure since founding, because uh, that matters a lot. Sustained home ownership was a problem even before the foreclosure crisis, frankly. And here's the market, uh, some, some key takeaways on market demand from the recently conducted Bowen um, housing needs assessment. I think this is, this is important. Um, so 43% of renters and 18% of homeowners are housing cost burdened. And the HUD definition of housing cost burden means that you're paying more than 30% of your gross income to housing costs. If you exceed that threshold, housing and urban development uh, says that oftentimes there are difficult choices that must be made to make ends meet between things like fresh healthy food, buying prescription medication, having access to transportation and other uh, necessities. And we know that, um, I didn't put this statistic up here, but there are a lot of people in Yellow Springs who are severely housing cost burden, meaning they pay over 50%. I know when I first started renting in Yellow Springs out of college, I paid 70% of my income to housing. And you know, at that point, you're counting out change on the floor to get groceries. I mean, I, I think there's a significant affordability problem in Yellow Springs that the numbers show. Um, Homes in Yellow Springs today, too, are more than $100,000 more expensive than in the surrounding area. And that's a testament to how wonderful our community is in some ways. I mean, the, the land values are strong because we have great schools. We have a number of amenities. We have a very safe community and a very strong community um, with lots of support services. And so that, again, is why we feel it's appropriate and responsible to create a model of affordable housing development that balances uh, the benefit to the community since the community is what is really responsible for those high land values and the um, empowering individuals um, with access to housing. Also, um, there are only six homes that were sold since 2014 under $150,000. And that's, that's a big deal. It's a significant barrier to being, for people being able to afford housing. Um, also, more than 1,200 people commute into Yellow Springs every day to work, um, which is in many ways the definition of what's becoming a bedroom community. So we want to make sure that we have a place for people who work here to live here, as well as for our elders, to support our elders. There's also very little freedom of movement. Um, people, Bowen uh, National or Research pointed that out in housing study. People don't have very many choices. I think probably everyone who lives in Yellow Springs has experienced that to some degree. If you want to move, where are you going to go? <coughs> um, and then also, I think it's worth noting that about a thousand people leave Yellow Springs to go to work every day. So there's also a disconnect there. Um, so we see this as one piece of a much broader economic development strategy. But we are making a difference. In terms of need, there are really two big affordability challenges. One is cost. We've talked about that. But the other one that um, the housing needs assessment didn't really go into very deeply is quality. I think Kaneta pointed to that. Um, the, the things that are on the market for under 200000 oftentimes need uh, investment. And it's not really affordable if you have to replace the roof and the furnace and it's not energy efficient and the windows are old and on and on. Um, so I think that's something to just keep in mind when we're thinking about strategies to tackle this problem. Um, and so community land trusts, like all community development initiatives, aim to address cost and quality. And um, as I said before, we're really a community stabilization strategy in Yellow Springs. I know this group cares a lot about participatory democracy, as do we. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about our governance structure. Um, 
And also that I wanted to address that our finances are transparent. As a public nonprofit, if you have web access, you can go online and view our 990 tax return. Um, we also have financials published in our uh, annual reports, which are on our website going back several years. We also get audited regularly, and those are available to anyone upon request. And if you have questions about a specific project's finances, call, stop by, email, Facebook message us, get in touch in some way, and we'll make an effort to answer your questions. Um, our operational funding comes from about four sources. Uh, membership dues and donations. We really are supported by the com community and have over 100 dues-paying members. Um, earned income from affordable housing development and rents, um, which also, any, any income we earn from housing is sort of, we get at the very end, and it acts as a second line of contingency. But we do try to earn a lot of our income through housing development. And then we have some programmatic and capacity grants and special events like our upcoming progressive dinner on Saturday, November 3rd. Um, and so I think you can move on. Here's just a little overview of our staff. Again, we started as an all-volunteer effort, and we now have three full-time staff with combined, uh, a combined more than 20 years of affordable housing development experience. Um, we also have a robust AmeriCorps VISTA and Antioch Miller Fellow program that enhances our capacity. You can see half of our staff are Antioch students. Um, and it's also worth noting, I think the first paid staff member of Yellow Springs Home Inc. was Andrew Klein, who uh, is with Green Generation Building now. And it was when he was on co-op at Antioch College. So we have a long history of really partnering with the college to build our capacity. So a community land trust, I think, in, in its most simple and straightforward terms, uh, it's important to note, I think, that it came out of the civil rights movement at the same time, um, you know, that the war on poverty came out and the Fair Housing Act of 1968, and community development was really seen as a public priority. And it is the idea that as a community, we can come together to own and protect land and public investment for the benefit of the community forever. It's very powerful. Uh, and it's very unique in the world of, of affordable housing um, to, to be so focused on something that's very place-based as a strategy. There are over 250 community land trusts around the United States. Um, and we're coming up on our 50th anniversary next year of the Community Land Trust Movement and the nation's first community land trust. Um, and I, as I said before, it's an attempt to balance individual benefit with community benefit. And then it's our job to make sure we live up to the audacity of perpetuity <laughs> by having solid business plans and a, and a good governance structure. Um, so the idea is to be deeply rooted in and committed to a particular place, in this case Yellow Springs, and provide stability through market ups and downs while preserving a stock of permanently affordable housing and other community assets governed by a community and resident board. At Home Inc., our mission is to strengthen community and income diversity, <laughs> and our four main strategies to do that are permanently affordable for sale housing, we have 20 units in Yellow Springs of that, permanently affordable rental housing, and right now we have six units under construction and another two are already up and running, financial coaching, and then post-purchase stewardship. I have to point out that Arthur Morgan local hero in Yellow Springs, um, president of Antioch College, is also in the Community Land Trust Hall of Fame. You can see the criteria here. Um, and there's a website, cltroots.org slash hall of fame, that gives the whole social history of the Community Land Trust movement. But um, our dear Arthur Morgan helped to wait, pave the way to Community Land Trust through two different land experiments while working for the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, and they were employee-owned land. Um, he looked to spread the ideas of decentralized economic development by supporting and working towards his ideas about dem democracy 
um, being fulfilled most uh, through a small community and how important that small community was. As a part of the original charter of his nonprofit Community Service Inc., Arthur Morgan included alternate ways of living as exemplified in the intentional community, loosely defined as people living in small groups, sharing land, and working together in business. So here you can see some of our attempted and completed projects. It's important for us to have a pipeline of potential uh, projects to pursue because some aren't going to work out and some will work out. Um, but you can see we've had pretty steady development and growth through the years. Um, other highlights I think that are important to point out is that we were the first community land trust in the state under the leadership of Marianne McQueen to receive approval to work with USDA backed rural development mortgages. That's a mouthful, but what it means is that mortgages are as low as a 1% interest rate with a longer amortization period, which saves people hundreds of dollars a month in their mortgages. And Chris Hall, our program manager, is one of only a couple of folks in the state of Ohio now to be certified to package those in-house. So people can come to us, even if they don't buy a home um, through the Yellow Springs Homing program, and secure, if they qualify for the program, secure access to those low interest mortgages. We were also the first community land trust in a multi-state region to gain approval for the Veterans Affairs Backed Mortgage product, and we had to go all the way to Washington, D.C. to get the approval, and now we help other community land trusts in other states access uh, this really important program, and then we get to work hand-in-hand -hand with the VA to be a stopgap, which is another layer of um, foreclosure prevention and services at post-purchase. And I have to say, it is our 20th anniversary this year. Yay! Yay! Um, so here are photos of some of the homes and people uh, over the last two decades. Um, I just, I have to say, these are people that you know. Sometimes the word affordable housing is a suitcase term, and we pack a lot of concerns, um, ideas, assumptions into that term. Uh, but these are people you know. We currently house more than 60 residents in homing homes, including a teacher at the Antioch School, a local baker, a small business owner who has a delicious uh, food truck, a retail employee downtown, Antioch employees, a singer in the World House Choir, a hospice nurse, a nurse, a nurse's aide, and others in the healthcare profession, veterans, people with special needs, elders in our community, nonprofit employees, including the director of a Peace Resource Center, employees of Community Solutions and Heartbeat Farms, an employee at the Little Art Theater. Community volunteers is another big area. A lot of people in home homes de dedicate some time to the community in one way or another. And so I, I just think it's important to note that the people who live in homing residences are really important members of our community and contribute in a variety of different ways every day to Yellow Springs. And so I'm going to try to answer the questions that were raised earlier and if, if not we'll, we'll circle back and make sure we address those. So we have 20 units of, of permanently affordable for sale housing and my original uh, presentation included a bunch of numerical examples and math, and then I thought, no, it's too complicated. So this is the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want some slides to see, come in later to our office and go through lots of examples and math and all that, we can do that. But um, so practically, you know, we're trying to ba have a balance. We, we get this public one-time investment to bring the cost down to an affordable level. Effectively, we're creating a submarket of community land trust homes um, in the community. So that one-time one -time subsidy, not ongoing subsidy, public investment fills the gap between how much it costs to build, develop, and bring a house online, and what is affordable using an affordability analysis to someone of low and moderate income. So we usually target one to one person per bedroom and then go down to about 65% of area median income as a starting place. And we say, what are the likely property taxes? What's the interest rate on the mortgage? 
Um, how much is homeowner's insurance going to be? And then we back into, okay, we think 115 would be a good starting price. Then we see how much it costs and we fundraise to fill the difference. So then a homeowner, after their income qualified as being uh, at or below typically 80% of area median income, which is considered <laughs> low income, so for some resales, um, we're allowed to go up to 100%, um, which is what's in our bylaws, but a lot of funding sources cap it at 80%. Um, so then someone goes through the income verification process. What is median income right now? Roughly. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Um, it varies by household size and it changes every year and it's based on the Dayton uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. So we'll give you a specific number. The, the thing that I think it's important, especially for seniors to know, is that your assets don't really count against you. We, we look at how much income is actually coming in from those assets, but the program doesn't penalize. Like if, if you had a retirement account, um, we wouldn't count all of those assets as part of your income. So um, we want people to be able to, and the federal government wants people to be able to save money um, and, you know, obviously housing is one big way to, to do that and to have financial security. Um, so the steps are you go onto the website uh, or stop in to the office, submit an application, there's one online, and then our program manager will reach out to you to set up a time for an intake interview where he'll go over, and those usually last a couple of hours, very individualized. Um, we'll look at your finances, set up an affordability analysis, look at what you're actually spending now on housing, because a lot of times people are paying more in rent than they do owning a home through our program. Um, we have assistance with household budgeting, um, and you, typically you leave with a plan, a financial plan. If you're ready to go, then you know, you're on the ready list, but a lot of times we find that people uh, need help with either debt reduction or improving their credit or some other strategies to become mortgage ready. And we talk about what a bank was going to look at. We do a front and back end ratio that says, you know, you can't have more than this percentage of your income going to housing plus debt. And just from the front end, this is what a bank would let you spend on a house. But is that realistic for your situation? Um, then if you stay on actively engaged on the um, list, there are a bunch of steps to go through before you can actually buy a house, including eight, eight hours of HUD-approved financial education, uh, credit and budgeting session with one of our partner agencies, a community land trust overview, reviewing the ground lease with an independent attorney, um, and a bunch of other steps. So it's, it's a big commitment um, from the home buyers. So then they close, they buy the house outright in a 99 year renewable leasehold estate, and then they live there as long as they want. They can pass the house down to their children if they want to. Um, there's no penalty for that. If their income goes up or down, uh, we just do a one-time income verification at the beginning, so you're not, we're not gonna kick you out. Um, if you make improvements, we have a capital improvements policy um, where we may give you uh, full credit in the resale uh, with approval for things that include the energy efficiency, health, safety, um, or durability of the home. If you want to put in a swimming pool or something that's you know either really going to be a whole bunch of money out of pocket for you or requires some sort of zoning approval, um, then we would want you to go and get that appropriate approval through the village in addition to having uh, approval from, from us, just to make sure that's a good, a good investment, if that makes sense. Um, so then if they ever sell the home, we'll, we'll look at what the new appraised value is on the open market and what you paid for it. And then um, there's a little resale formula, so you get some of the increase in appraised value, but not all of it. So you pay forward some of the help you got to the next person through a still reduced below market sales price, and you walk away with a portion of the increase in appraised value, um, any capital improvement credits that were granted, any down payment, and any equity that you got from just paying down your mortgage. 
Um, so what we found is that people do walk away with money while um, they don't get a windfall. You know, a lot of that public investment is then sustained so that it can help the next family. Any questions? Did I lose anyone? That was a lot. I, I've got a question. So if somebody wants to, um, who has property and wants to put in a swimming pool or make some kind of improvement, what are your bylaws um, in regards to protecting your investment? So there, any, the, our uh, ground lease says that you have to get approval from the board for anything that's going to change the structure or footprint. Um, and then there's a process of materials, workmanships, permitting. Um, that said, it's sometimes hard to enforce non-monetary ground lease violations, and the um, village of Yellow Springs is prob probably in a stronger place to be able to, to do that. So we're looking, that's a question we're continuing to look at in terms of how we structure the contracts moving forward. Have you adjusted the contracts moving forward already? No, we're going through a conversation about okay. it. Yeah, just trying to figure out what is fair and balanced because we don't want to be paternalistic either. I mean, it's a homeowner, mm -hmm. um, but we also want to make sure that we are thinking about uh, having some strategies in place to be able to address situations as they arise if it's an extreme situation. And protect other homeowners or work with other homeowners and uh, who might be beside us. Yes. Okay. The other side of the coin, how do you enforce upkeep of, of home ink homes? I noticed one house in town got quite uh, run down over the years. How do you uh, control that? Well, um, we're not landlords. So in some ways, we, we don't have a whole lot of control over that. We create a set of expectations. The ground lease says, you know, you're not to have deferred maintenance. Um, we entered into a partnership with the community, um, the credit union, uh, the Yellow Springs Credit Union, to be able to um, create a very low interest revolving loan fund to help folks with repairs. Um, and then we also have us identified other repair funds. Um, and we do a lot of upfront budgeting so people are ready for those costs. Um, and then the, our, the point at which we could intervene is if someone is violating a permit, some sort of local ordinance, then we would alert the village to that. Or at resale, we require that it's move-in ready. So we would upgrade the home to where it needs to be to be move-in ready and take that out of seller equity if needed. But folks know that it's in their best interest to maintain the homes over time. Um, and sometimes you can't control for all variables. But you know, it's a shared responsibility. And home ownership, it, there is a risk in it, and you have to be ready for it and, and take it on. And we've been, um, I think we've had a really pretty good track record in terms of um, preserving that, the quality of the homes over time, and especially at resale. hearing a couple of things. Um, we were talking about the ground leasehold and certain responsibilities. In terms of the deed, uh, how is that handled? Is the uh, person, is the buyer, uh, do they have full control of the deed or is there a joint deed? So what you enter into the 99 year renewable uh, ground lease at closing, and then what is filed with the county is a memorandum of ground lease outlining that leasehold interest. Um, this happens in commercial real estate a lot. You see it less so in home ownership closings. Uh, but the community land trust retains ownership of the land subject to this 99 year uh, leasehold estate that is a, a binding legal document filed with the county. And it outlines that uh, balance of, of responsibilities. <coughs> and the main reason that that's true is because it's really hard to enforce deed restrictions. I mean, our program could run through a deed restriction instead of um, the, instead of the um, ground lease or leasehold estate, but, but it's, it's been shown that, that it doesn't always work. You're very limited in, in your ability to enforce, enforce those deed restrictions through resales. 
So in terms of taxes, uh, because of that situation, is that home or not? The way how Yellow Spring structures it, it's based upon the land, plus the uh, homes on the land, or does it? The, be, because the homeowners are have the everyday rights to the land, I mean, we are not landlords. We can't even go onto the property without permission. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not a typical uh, uh, leasey lessor situation. Um, we believe that it is fair for the homeowners to pay property taxes. So you enforce that through the contract. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What's the usual cost burden of people who move into these houses compared to the, I mean, about 43% of owners now in Yellow Springs are cost burden. So just the people who get these these units end up with 29% or 15% or how does that change for them? Well, I think, so the 43% is renter households who are housing cost burdens. Just a point of clarification, it's 18% of homeowners. But I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, we do an affordability analysis to make sure someone can really afford the payments in the home before they move in. And we work with um, the bank, some of the bank um, ranges. So uh, it varies by program, but it's usually, the bank doesn't want to see you spend more than 30% to all household costs. Carrying so are costs. most of the people who get home in units paying very close to that 30%? Are they substantially below that because of this help they're getting with the house? Oh, no, they're usually, um, I would say, between, I know the Federal Home Loan Bank requires that they be, be paying between 20 and 30% of their mortgage. Um, we typically see 25 to 30% um, is the, the range that we typically look, look for. So no, I wouldn't say the homes are over-subsidized. To answer your question. Um, so the other thing I just wanted to say is that the Community Land Trust is about fairness across place. Um, there is a lot of data coming out right now that can correlate your life expectancy to your zip code. And I mean, when you think about that, there's just something inherently really unfair. So this is about making sure um, that people have access to um, housing in a community that has, I mean, it's incredible how much stable housing and the community you live in have an impact on youth outcomes, educational attainment, physical well-being, how long you live. I mean, <coughs> housing is really connected to everything, so we think it's really important. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to point out is that as an industry, community land trusts beat the uh, prime mortgage market 10 to 1 in uh, the foreclosure crisis. So that means even prime, not counting subprime mortgages, had a 10 times higher rate of going into foreclosure than community land trust mortgages all across the United States, um, which I think is really powerful. We do post-purchase, the post-purchase piece well. Um, and in Yellow Springs, again, we've never had a foreclosure. That doesn't mean one couldn't happen, uh, but we have directly intervened before um, up to and including uh, paying uh, default while we work with the seller to find a safe landing. Uh, there are really a lot of different mechanisms that we're allowed to do uh, to, to support homeowners when times do get tough. Yes? You said that data were coming out indicating that many people were living less long lives because of where they live. But most of us here, if not almost all of us, live here because we wanted to. So how does our life expectancy compare to some other areas nearby where people are forced to live for business reasons or uh, monetary reasons or whatever? That's a great question that we will have to research and get back to you. I saw Canada taking yeah. taking us. That's a really, really good question, and we should know the answer to that. So we'll, we'll look into it. I don't know off the top of my head. I have a question. Yes. I've heard most of your activities in Yellow Springs. Are you active also in Miami Township? Our um, home buyer coaching program and the rural development loan program do go outside of Yellow Springs, but right now all of our housing activity is focused in Yellow Springs. 
I think our, our bylaws allow us to go uh, into Miami Township, and so I think we would be really interested in exploring some opportunities there, but uh, so far we've really been very focused on Yellow Springs. Um, it sounds to me like if, if a person <coughs> moves into one of your homes at less than 80% of the median income, and 10 years later they're 110 or 120% of the median income, then that is not contributing to the diversity of the community. So um, it looks like you're only contributing to the diversity of the community when you sell the house. And if a person chooses to live there for 20 years <coughs> and has really low rent, even though they're making a pretty good income, they have some real advantages over those of us who pay the regular um, uh, cost of living from the very beginning. My understanding is that the rental program does an annual income verification. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. We're learning as we go here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that would be monitored a little more closely, but our board determined that it wasn't fair to kick someone out of their house if they own it. Well, it's not of kicking them out if this is the agreement under which they buy it. I mean, it's not like like it's anything unknown to them. My argument would be that in the, in the long run, it is dampening the market. Because eventually there'll be a resale. But as long as people stay there, right. I mean, and, and the incentive to stay there, especially in these three bedroom, two bath houses, I mean, that's what most people are buying and living in now. Uh, they can stay there forever and leave it to their kids, and, and then their kids, I mean, so it's not really contributing to that point. Okay. Well, that's making some assumptions, too, about people's income <coughs> growing up. Growing uh, yeah, up I fast. said it, and people, Sometimes income goes down, too. And if I could just add, too, that this is, okay. um, <laughs> this is something that is helping people, let's say that they are at 80%. So I would have been at 80%. I was a single mom and a teacher. Being able to build wealth as a single mom, it would be nearly impossible for me to buy a house on the market, right? So being able to get a home income, and let's say that I did you know, end up becoming principal and I make a lot of money, way more money than I as a teacher, what we see is not only is it giving that person the ability to go on to a market rate house, but also build wealth in a situation where they might not have been able to do that before. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we've found, too, that um, most people that sell home homes do so because there's a change in their household size or income, and they're going on to purchase a market rate home. Mm -hmm. all the, I think nine of the ten resales people went on to buy market rate homes. Mm -hmm. And it's a higher return to buy a market rate home. It's in your best yeah. interest to do that. And as we know from the data, um, the majority of household wealth for people of low income is their home. Mm -hmm. Do they and buy these in Yellow Springs? Sometimes. Sometimes they... One out of nine or seven out of nine? I don't know that number. Yeah. No, I know some of them have, and then some of them have relocated for various reasons, like um, the, the Morgans just moved to the town nearby where their parents live, for example. Would it be feasible place? to consider having the rentals, the annual review of their income, based on the percentage of their income, as other housing programs often do? I think um, Section 8 might do this, for example, so, you give a percentage, if that's, am I right, Kate? Yeah. yeah. So this is not, so what we're contributing right now through our rental program, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is okay. not um, subsidized housing. Okay. So, subsidized housing right. yeah. means so every month some entity is helping you pay. Now we would accept Section 8 vouchers. So I mean that that would be you know that could be where the subsidized housing came in. But this is really what we're looking at is a one-time public investment, and then the rents are set, um, and someone has to be income qualified to live in the rentals. The home ownership program does work differently. 
hmm, I've seen this whole program, and you're not halfway through, and we're running out. I don't uh, know how long this is. Uh, okay. Okay. one. Yeah. Okay, well, so, so, moving. There's a lot of information coming up. If there's a way of writing down your question or detail. Oh, okay. I think these are good questions, and this is going well, but it's, we're, there's, there's more to come. All right. But let's okay. So, um, again, I just wanted to talk about home ownership is sustained. And th that's really important. I think sustaining home ownership is in some ways as important as access because the folks who live in uh, or are accessing housing are more vulnerable to trigger events such as uh, a, the death of a family member or a loss in income or a divorce. Jo uh, you know, I mean, they're a health crisis. Um, and even before the foreclosure crisis, low and moderate income households only had a two in one, a one in two, a 50% shot at sustaining home ownership for five years before returning to renting. And you don't make money in a house if you only live there for five years. Um, you know, you really, I mean, the realtors say, the data says, you have to really live there for about seven years to quickly to start seeing some kind of return. So uh, we think it's really important to focus on the, the post-purchase piece as well, and, and setting people up for success on the front end to be able to sustain um, their mortgage. So this is a question we get a lot. Where does the money come from? So we have to raise a lot of money to make this happen. Um, so here are the sources that we've used before. You can see the list. Um, I will note that the Ohio Housing Finance Agency, due to a shrink in the receipts for their affordable housing trust fund, um, do not fund home ownership right now. So it is very challenging to find funding for home ownership. Um, rental funding is a lot easier to obtain, but you need way more of it. So for a home ownership unit, the, the person buying the home can probably afford about two-thirds of the total cost to develop. For a rental, maybe 10%. So we have to raise a, a lot more money on the front end. Um, there's also really not a good funding source or combination of sources to make acquisition rehab work. That's a strategy we would love to pursue in Yellow Springs to get those houses that need a lot of work, invest in them, and then bring them in so we're not just doing new construction. But there's really not it's very, very challenging to find the funding to make that work. Um, we're increasingly looking at impact investing and program-related investments. That's where a foundation meets its mission by giving you a low interest or no interest loan to be able to move forward with land acquisition or um, some of the pre-development costs. Um, it's also worth noting, and I think this comes back to the request to the, to the village to invest in um, in our capital campaign right now. Um, but no funding entity will fund an entire project, uh, what's needed. So like maybe we can get 25,000 per unit from the Federal Home Loan Bank, but the gap is 50. Or you know, uh, maybe 50,000 a unit from OFA, but the gap for the rental units is more like 100,000 per unit. So we have to piece together these different uh, uh, layers of funds and the funders assume there's going to be a local layer um, so we've been sort of inching along without that that local support for a long time um, but I think we could do something powerfully if if we partnered more with the village and and then that you know I mean the return on investment is pretty significant um, in terms of bringing outside money into the community um, so progress has been slow because we need to put so many sources together. A great example is the West Davis Street project. Um, it took us two years to fundraise to build two units, and we had to put together 11 funding sources. Um, you know, that limits our ability to grow, um, you know, when we're up against those challenges. And that said, we're committing <coughs> to doing whatever is needed to make the mission work, but we, we really see how valuable that partnership with the, the village could be as a a community stabilization economic development strategy. Um, you know, it creates a lot of um, construction related jobs, property tax revenue, a improved and secured tax base, and is in line with some of the current village goals and values. Um, 
and again, I think just we believe in this work so much, we're willing to, you know, do backflips and jump through hoops and get cut through all the red tape to make it work. But um, um, this is not easy stuff. It's pretty complicated. So, uh, a great example is just our recent application for the six unit project to the Ohio Housing Finance Agency um, was the application just for that one funding source, and there were about five in it, was uh, over a thousand pages long. And that was just the preliminary application. I mean, this stuff is just pretty wild stuff. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I have a couple of questions about the money. Sure. Um, as you said, you spent $1 million in 22 units. It's about $185,000 a unit. Mm -hmm. What percentage of that comes from those other sources, and what percentage comes from the homeowners? And here's $5 for me because I want to help you. So that's a complicated question because it's covering our 20-year history, and each project is a little bit different. But as a general rule of thumb, um, the typically, uh, I would say the total development cost for a home ownership unit, we have to raise um, about a, two, a third of the total development cost, a subsidy. So if it's under 80,000, 60,000, the sales price would be 120. That's just a very generic rule of thumb. And then for rentals, we have to raise 80 to 90 percent of the total development cost. So then the homeowner would pay that. Money, right. Money to pay them money. Exactly. All right. And then they get a chance to build equity from that investment, as well as a portion of the increase in appraised value. And you know, most housing home ownership funding actually subsidizes the home buyer, and it burns off. So um, they might get an above market return after five, 10, 15 years. Um, requiring a lot more public investment. So this is actually kind of, in many ways, a more conservative approach to housing development. I have a not directly related question. Could you tell us what percentage of new buyers or new renters already live or work in Yellow Springs? I ask this because Green Met Housing was funded by villagers <coughs> to house village employees. And I believe now less than 10% of those renters uh, came from Yellow Springs or work in Yellow Springs. Sure. Um, so I think that's a really good question because for a whole bunch of different reasons. <laughs> but, but, um, so the first thing I can say is that 100% of the tenants in homemade houses live and or work in Yellow Springs. At the time, we'll right? No, I'm being <coughs> silly, but um, I don't have a I don't have a statistic for you right now. It's a mix of folks from who were already here and folks that came in, and most people have some kind of connection to Yellow Springs. But we're going to talk about affirmative marketing soon, and that's uh, I think a broader answer to your question. So hold your hold your thought, and then. Uh, we can also try to get some of that data for you. It's not something that we that we I can just pull out as a statistic right now. Um, so here's our current project, and I'm going to hand things off to Kenetta in a moment. But um, I think it's important to note that we're committed to developing a pipeline of small, medium, and large projects with home ownership and rentals targeting a variety of different area median incomes. We have heard from the people of Yellow Springs, we need to serve people at lower area median incomes who can't afford the home ownership program. And higher, speaking to your, your concern earlier, Mitzi, about moderate income going up to 120% or maybe even some kind of market rate component. So we're committed to doing that. We secured a national business planning fellowship through the Community Land Trust Network and um, join a cohort to create a business plan. What do we need to do to have the capacity to administer a multifamily rental program? This is way more complicated than home ownership. Then we fundraised and we got local funds to create a new position. Uh, Brittany is now in her fourth year with Yellow, or getting ready to go into her fourth year with Yellow Springs Homing. And she brought multifamily rental development experience to us and has really helped us um, navigate the complexity of these projects 
Um, a, a feature of this particular project is we're the first group in the state of Ohio to combine um, t these two Ohio state funds and they had um, not totally compatible regulations. So that took a year with a lot of attorneys to sort through, but um, now we've paved the way so other groups can combine these different funding sources. Um, and I think it's important to note too that this is not subsidized housing. It could work with housing subsidies if people have a Section 8 voucher, but um, this is a one-time investment, so it is not subsidized housing, which is why we have to raise so much on the front end. Um, and then I think it's also important to note that we raise 100% of the commitments for this housing before the shovel hits the ground. Do you think um, of the dollar value for the village contributions, like um, running infrastructure to the building? And so this, uh, in this particular project, the village waived zoning and tap-in fees. Uh -huh. And I'm not, Marianne, do you know the... Well, I know we just recently raised the tap-in fees significantly. And this, and we, it was secured before that, and then we had to come back to council and get a, a second approval, but I think it's maybe $1,500 a unit is how much we would have had to spend. Um, I don't know what that cost is to the village for that in-kind donation. <coughs> so I'm gonna hand things over to Kanata. Yeah. All right, so hello. Um, we do have brochures for the Forest Village Homes project over here. Um, we also have some fair housing um, brochures too. Um, so with the Forest Village Homes project, it is a rental project and it's right, it's right here on Dayton Street. Um, we have four units of one bedroom that's going to be coming up. They actually have started digging in on that, so that's really exciting. And that's on the corner of King and Dayton. And then across the street, at the, like close to the corner of Dayton and High, we have the two um, two bedroom units going in. So again, nearly 45% of renters are housing costs burning in Yellow Springs. And so that's a big reason why we're focusing on rental as well. Um, and of course, with the um, housing needs assessment, we see that there is a huge need for affordable rental. <laughs> <laughs> so you see there are four, one bedroom, and how many, two bedrooms? Two. Um, two. It's a duplex. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the duplex is on one site, and the one bedrooms are on the other site. Mm -hmm. And then um, the rents are low, so those are targeting um, about 55%, but an average of about 60% of area median income, which I do have that pulled up here. So with area median income, okay. <coughs> So 100% of area median income for one person, that's $46,000. So we'll take 60% of that and then that's how we get that 60% area median income. All right? And, it, and then for what about a two person household? So for two people, 100% is 52,600. So that's right at the 100% of area median income. So we'd be going significantly below that for Forest Village Homes. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So seniors, is this really for, I guess, low, low income or average individuals? Are you looking at um, seniors? Are you looking at um, people in town um, that I don't know, might have mental health issues or? So both. Both. 100% um, of the housing will go to special needs and that does include seniors. Um, that includes any type of um, physical or mental disability that one might have as well. It, it's really a pretty broad definition and it's on our website on the rental page and a lot of people uh, qualify mm -hmm. for, under the special needs and definition. Do um, people who live in town have priority versus people who are from out of town? So we can't do that because of our funding sources. We okay. don't have the ability to give priority. But what we do see is we have already have over 100 people on the interest list with calls almost daily. And the majority of those people have either lived here before, um, currently live here, or have some connection so they have family. Um, and like I said, both sites are on Dayton Street. 
and they're fully accessible or adaptable. Yes. So that's a really exciting piece of that, um, especially with the amenities that we have. Being on Dayton Street, it's really close to downtown, so it's a short distance to downtown. Um, there will be off-street parking, so that's really nice, especially being on Dayton Street. Um, and I actually was at the duplex earlier, dropping off a ladder for the, the painting, and it's it's really amazing to see that when I first I'm on Dayton Street, so I live on Dayton Street, and walking by, I just saw this piece of land, and being able to walk by there daily and see the the change that's happened there, it's, it's been really great. Um, just progress. I got to come in on the later half of that though, so it seems like all this progress is happening really fast and everyone's like, ah, this is taking so long, but definitely worth it. All right. And the, I think the other features of the home, uh, of these apartments, not only will they be wheelchair accessible or adaptable, which is so important for aging in place, they're highly energy efficient, mm -hmm. the average rent, uh, and there will be a range of rents because we're targeting different area median incomes and the larger uh, units will be more expensive, but um, the average rent is 575 and that will include all utilities. Wow. Um, and then they also will include washer and dryer machines mm -hmm. um, and a lot of other features. There's, it's going to be a really nice, I think, uh, project. Are yeah. there washers and dryers for each unit or a for group? Each, for each unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with this um, project, we can go to the next slide. Um, with this project, we've implemented an affirmative marketing and outreach um, to go kind of beyond, you know, who is typically marketed to. So if people are very familiar with Homey, a lot of it comes from word of mouth. So when you have word of mouth, who ends up knowing about our, our services, our homes, it's folks who know someone who already lives here, right? So this serves our mission to strengthen the community and diversity in the village. And so when we talk about diversity, we're talking about a large range of diversity. So we've been meeting with contacts that we have in Yellow Springs and around um, to be able to market this to folks who have disabilities, um, to market this to seniors. So I was at the Senior Center recently talking about this. Um, reaching out to different racial and ethnic groups as well. So we have a very large range of folks that we're looking to market to for this. And with affirmative marketing, it's kind of the other, ha the other half of fair housing. So when you know about fair housing, most people are like, well, you can't discriminate against people when you're trying to rent or sell home. Correct. But on the flip side of that, because of um, fair housing law, you not only can't discriminate, but you have to actively go out and reach the underrepresented and underserved folks in your community. So for instance, um, we met with the people at Welcome Dayton, uh, was that two weeks ago, right? And so Welcome Dayton works with people um, who are refugees and immigrants in the Dayton area. And so we reached out to them to see like, hey, you know, how can we do better about reaching refugee populations, reaching immigrant populations, um, especially because those folks are underserved in the housing market. Um, another part of that is not only who is underserved, but we've kind of gone a step out from that and who is actively and sometimes <coughs> passively discriminated against in housing. So that's something that I've definitely learned over the last few months is that when, and I always have to keep myself from saying this, but when advertising, um, especially when it comes to disabilities, saying it's a short walk to downtown don't want to say things like that because that is very limiting and that is actually um, discriminatory against folks who cannot walk. So, like I said, our goal is to connect with contacts throughout the village in the greater Dayton area to welcome diverse groups of people to our program and to the village. Um, so even if people aren't, they're like, mm, I, I don't know if I want to buy a home, home or I don't know if I want to rent, they can still come to us for their, their financial coaching needs and things like that. Um, like I mentioned, this goes above and beyond fair housing regulations, um, which focus specifically on federally protected classes. Um, we do this because it's a priority, not just because we have to, so that's something that's built into our mission and our values at Homing. Um, and so, um, like I mentioned, non-protected classes, um, we're also reaching out to include veterans, 
um, LGBTQ and victims of domestic violence. So that's something as well that um, we are working toward. Yeah. So we do we did do a statistical analysis to see where those gaps were and see who is underserved and underrepresented in our community. And so that's where we got the um, groups from to say, okay, so we know these groups of people are underrepresented and underserved, so let's find contacts to talk to about this. And so some of our meetings include, like I mentioned, um, Welcome Dayton. A few weeks ago I did visit the 365 Project group um, and distributed some flyers. I went to the Senior Center. Um, we're gonna be coming up on um, visiting the Greene County um, Department of Developmental Disabilities as well. Um, and so this is us also asking how can we better, how can we work to better serve um, and support specific groups in our community, um, what's missing in our infrastructure and our services, and how can we be a more welcoming community. And I think that, that um, especially with this project, thinking about the accessibility and the adaptability, that's something that's very difficult for folks who are trying to find housing. Um, in addition to um, being accessible and adaptable outside, there are zero step entrances too. So just having that in our mind, because that's something that I never really thought about until I would say this past summer. You know, I'm walking down the street and I'm like, oh, like I'm gonna step into this, this uh, restaurant or the store and it has a little bit of a lip. So for me, that's no problem, but for someone with mobility issues, that's a barrier. And so we don't think, we think of barriers as systemic, which they totally are, but there are also physical barriers that prevent people from being able to access all that we say is to welcome them. Okay, next slide. Yeah. So uh, we have 15 minutes left. <laughs> We're fluid. And we have two two more slides, so okay. it should be okay. But yes. Yeah. I think it's it's one thing to supply housing and help with housing, care of village and resident yeah. care. But I don't see going out and recruiting people to move here just because we're building the housing. That, that doesn't seem right. So that is mandated by the federal government as part of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which was signed into law seven days after Dr. King was assassinated. Well, then why do we need to build the house? Well, there is sufficient market demand in Yellow Springs <coughs> today for that housing. We're just making sure that um, not only are residents of Yellow Springs getting access to it, but we're also being thoughtful about who's not in our community when compared with the broader region and reaching out specifically to those groups because it I matters so much where you live. Well, and here's the other part of that too is that with, you know, when we are thinking about who has access to Yellow Springs. So if we have, if we have the ability to say, okay, we want to be a more diverse group of people, but we only stick to who's already here, we're not gonna be more diverse. And so when I'm thinking about it, I think about, so we, if we're thinking about refugee populations who might need to move, when we're talking to Welcome Dayton, really, it's not like we want more people to come here and we wanna push everyone who already lives here out. That's not our mission. But our mission is to say, Yellow Springs is a great place to live, you know, we have a lot of amenities, we have great schools, we have all of these things to offer, and it shouldn't be just people who can afford to live here that are welcome to that. And to me, I think a, a big part of that, and the reason why I'm here now, is because I did teach in Dayton for a while, and I understood how housing is so important to the development of a child. I've seen kids go through um, situational homelessness, and things of that nature. And to me, as a person who was able to move here because I had the, um, the ability to find a house that was in my affordability range, that shouldn't just be because I had that ability. I think that just about anyone who wants to move here should be able to do so. And that would increase our ability to say, look, we're a diverse community. We have people of all different backgrounds and all different mixed incomes. 
And I, I think that's really where we're coming from here. It doesn't mean that everyone from outside of Yellow Springs is gonna move here. It just means that we've done what we need to do, not only because the federal government says you have to, but because it's in our mission to, to say, if you are of low income, you have a place here. And what we noticed is, and again, the 365 project is Yellow Springs based. And when speaking to the group there, you know, they're gonna go back and talk to people where in Yellow Springs about this. So, like I mentioned before, in our interest list, the majority of the people on the interest list either have a connection here, um, have lived here in the past, or currently live or here. Or they already live here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we find a mix. We find a mix of both. So we're actively advertising in Yellow Springs. We know there's sufficient market demand here, but we also know from the fair housing analysis that it would be discriminatory to limit people into our program that just live here because we're not as racially diverse as the greater region. Can I, can I say something? Uh, because I have been involved both in Home Inc. And, and on council, I'm the lead housing person. For me, personally, but I think for the majority of people in Yellow Springs who have responded to uh, the surveys, having a diverse and sustainable community is very important. And I got that um, desire through Arthur Morgan, which is why I came to Yellow Springs and met Don Hollister. We share some of this concern. The idea of having a small community that is sustainable, that if you look around the room, most of us have gray hair. If we only had us in this community, that would not be sustainable. So what is this, what makes a community sustainable is having a way for young people, young adults, and young families to move in, or, or maybe, well, my son is now in Sweden, but some of us are fortunate, like me, to have multi-generational families here, to be able to have that dynamic as well as racial and ethnic diversity, to be able to have our own school system, and um, to be able to have enough jobs here so that people can work and live here. Those are the kind of things that create a sustainable community, and most of the people I think in Yellow Springs want that. I resent going out and recruiting people to come and occupy housing here that the taxpayers have had a significant amount of contributing to. I thought we were supposed to take care of ourselves, our, our own, well, with, with, with housing, not with recruiting and from all over. Part of the answer to that goes back to Paul's question or point about green metropolitan housing. Uh, I didn't remember it being specifically for village employees, but that's how it was when sold we, the village. we, when the village gave land for the Quarry Street uh, Green Met project, there was ex it was explicit that there would be priority for, and we're not talking about homing, priority for residents of Yellow Springs, mm -hmm. but the federal funding was explicit in not allowing geographic preference. Yeah. And that you know, a lot of these, it's, it's even, it's a lot of, this isn't directly to your point, but in a lot of the funding, uh, I mean, I am locally prejudiced, but I recognize that there are other countervailing forces. And with that being locally preferenced, I can completely understand that, but what happens is, and no one is thinking this way, right? If you're saying, I want just Yellow Springers living here. No one's thinking about it being discriminatory in any other way, but it ends up being discriminatory in any other way because of the fact that this is a, ma the, a majority white area. So if you say that we can only include Yellow Springers, there's a, gonna be a small percentage of people, if racially, that will not be able to be included in it. I know I'm you're not saying. saying. I know. I don't think it's necessary to go out and recruit people to come and recruit. 
How, you know, I, I think recruit is one term, but letting people know that this place yeah. exists is, that's, that's a different distinction. Yeah, we're not. If I'm an option, I don't find out about it. I don't have to have somebody out recruiting. So the, the federal uh, government requires that we do a statistical analysis of our area. What was really interesting is that in terms of the affluent population, we are very consistent with the greater region in terms of racial diversity. And I think that's a testament to the inclusive infrastructure that Yellow Springs has always had, going back for many generations. It's something to be proud of. Um, but in terms of the lower income demographics, um, we are uh, not nearly as diverse as the region. There are a lot um, in terms of a bunch of different criteria, but um, the main one being um, representation by uh, Hispanic and uh, Latina, popu or Latina populations yeah. um, and uh, African American. And then we also ha don't have enough um, special needs or accessible housing stock. Those were some of the big takeaways when we did this statistical analysis. So we're mandated to come up with a plan to make identify community contacts. Um, that doesn't mean we're create, it's, it's going to be a, a very fair process of applying for the housing and we're not gonna prevent people from who live in Yellow right. Springs from accessing it. And in fact, we found that the majority of people who are interested in our program have some very strong connection to Yellow Springs. Either they currently live here, or they used to live here, or their kids go to school here, but they're on open enrollment, or there's some sort of connection. And, yes. Let me ask a question that I asked Council and Homink a decade ago, sure. a couple of times. How much is enough? What is your goal, numerical or percentage goal for your effort, wouldn't there you? When have you been successful? Well, we celebrate. And I'll ask council the same question with the sure. The diversity. So we we uh, celebrate successes along the way, but in terms of the broader mix, um, the housing needs assessment did an incredible job. There was a slide earlier showing, um, you know, the the active market demand, which is a tiny portion of the need. You know, the demand is like, how many could we reasonably mm -hmm. anticipate to uh -huh. build and sell within a given time frame? but the need is much greater. So I think at this point, um, you know, we're very interested in supporting the village in housing goals, so I'll defer to Marianne on this So one. there's demand, and, and you'll feed the demand until no one wants to live in Yellow Springs. Well, oh. Mary, I believe the housing task force has some very specific goals for the next five to ten years and that those we would be supporting those goals well first I'd just like to say that this is um, a very conflictual uh, topic mm -hmm. and clearly given that I've devoted about 20 years of my life to affordable housing and housing I have a passionate interest in it and I understand that there are people that have different feelings and people in this room that have different feelings mm -hmm. and historically we've had issues about it so and we're not going to solve it now but what the house what i i'm going to make sure that the housing needs assessment which was done last year that the uh goal uh proposed goals by the man that did the housing needs assessment for us are available on our website so that people can access it because it's a lot of information i can't i don't even know the answer but the goals that council is going to uh, agree to at its next council meeting, I believe, are that we will have a 10 to 15 year plan to encourage the development of 300 to 500 new housing units. Three, 60% of those will be, our goal would be, will be rental all i'm not just talking about affordable housing i'm talking about <coughs> market rate and low income moderate income and upper income housing 60 percent rental 40 percent home ownership and then the home ownership we would uh, the idea would be that that would be targeted toward moderate income and upper income primarily so 
some lower income, but mostly moderate income, 80% to 120% area median income, and upper income. The rental targeted to a very low, low, moderate, and some upper income. So that's a very general thing. And um, the, the goal in, I mean, the reason why we have this goal is because the housing needs assessment indicated that there was this need and that there was this desire. And that one way to help lower the housing costs for everyone is to increase the housing stock. Another critical need is for seniors to have places that they can move to, which will be, that's clearly one of the focuses, both for low income se seniors, middle income, and upper income. So, so when we reach these. In that, in that analysis, I think that's a, a reasonable plan, to be mindful of the fact that there are many homeowners in the village who have, for generations, worked very, very hard to um, keep, to maintain the property that they have. And our property values will be impacted about what home is programs as well as the village's plan. So Actually, home, the, I just have to intervene because um, the home bank homes are not used as comps when establishing oh, okay, real estate values. Mm -hmm. okay. It that's is a good. total okay. sub market. Okay. It is not going to bring down your okay. property tax values that's and it never has. Okay. And even and my there, taxes are still going to go up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they're not going to be negatively impacted yeah. by this process. And no, because our okay. sales okay. are not listed on the okay. MLS, so they're, they're not used as comps. Oh, it's really a I'd like well, that's true. Yeah. You know, that's true. That does impact in terms of the appearance <laughs> because if the person next to you, you well, okay, I don't want to hold up time, please. So I'd like to expand yeah. just a minute on what Paul said. We all know that if everyone in the community is high income, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. We all know that if everyone in the community is low income, we can't provide the services we want. Mm -hmm. And I think what Paul is asking is where is that middle ground? Mm -hmm. uh, do we think if, do we think we can have 40% of the housing in Yellow Springs low income and still have the services we no, want? That or do we think 30% or do we think 15%? That's I think what Paul is asking. Yes. Well, I don't have those the the study that was done, both the needs assessment and the goals, I don't have all that information in my head. But um, it's on the website. Yeah. 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 Yes. And I think it's the, what's kind of interesting is Yellow Springs was founded by the Owenites seeking utopia. <laughs> and our public policy um, here in Yellow Springs is kind of doing the same thing. I think that it's going to be a very long time and we would have to be wildly successful to get to the point where we said, do we have too much affordable housing? Because we're not anywhere close to that. We're, we're nowhere close to that at this time. So when the needs assessment was, was done, was it just of the needs of the current people who are in Yellow Springs? Because I think that's what we were, they, they were talking about is, yes. is, is this project actually going to be, um, Servicing those that have been that were uh, that were shown on the needs assessment. Yes. If you are recruiting people from outside of Yellow Springs and bringing them all in, how many then that were on that needs assessment is actually going to be able to? We'll, ha we'll have to benefit from that. So we we pick the products, the pricing, the model. This this uh, project we're working on now is a great example of that based on the needs of people living in Yellow Springs right now. I think we have to take an alternate approach to answer those questions. Most of us did not come here by accident. Hardly anybody comes here by accident. And even though Hang on, please. Sure. If we spend some of our money to make it easier and more wonderful for people who want to come here to actually come, then that's a good thing. And that's a partial answer to Becky's point. Yes, we're spending money, and yes, some people from outside are going to be attracted, but she was too, and so was I, and so was my wife. Okay, okay, we all were, that's the point. 
hardly anybody comes here by accident. So if we're spending money to make it easier and better for people to come, those are the people that are going to come anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point because even the affordable housing in Yellow Springs is competing with surrounding areas from price point. Yeah. You know, an, an affordable house in Xenia is going to be a lot less than an afford even an affordable yeah. house in Yellow Springs with all the subsidy in it. So, I mean, it's still, there's still a, a, a trade-off to live here. I mean, people have to intentionally want to live here. They're not going to land here accidentally. I think that's a really, really good point. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think it's a, really a tricky and complex problem, and yeah. I think you guys are trying to do a little bit to make it better, and you're working against possible odds, and yeah. you've got to you know, get a lot of money together, and you have restrictions that come from external sources that you have to abide by, and whatever the conflict is here. So I'm appreciative of your efforts, but I think being able to have more clear answers of some of the quantifications would help your cause. Numbers but, of things. And there was because a slide. Those are, because the conversation a lot of times tends to be ask a question and give the answer that you want, somebody to hear, but they want to hear a different answer. And so, figuring out how to respond to some of those quantifications sure. to simplify the answers so, would probably you know, help I, I appreciate that. There was a slide earlier showing the active market demand over the next five years. Um, I don't know if you want to flip back to that or not, but it, it shows specific numbers. I, don't, I think it would be a miracle if we met that demand over the next five years. And after five years, we're going to have to reassess and come up with a new uh, understanding of how far we've gotten, but I think it showed an active market demand for 180 units of uh, rental housing that was either subsidized or like what we're doing available to low income renters plus 70 units of workforce rental housing available to moderate income earners plus 70 units of affordable housing um, for low and moderate income households. I think it would be amazing if we made 10% of that goal over the next five years. So I, I don't think we're ready to answer that question, how much is enough, to be honest with you. And the Housing Needs Assessment lays, lays out the goals pretty clearly for the next five years. If the village agrees to that assessment that these, this mix of 200 units is our goal, what is the goal of Home Inc. once that is met? Do you reduce your efforts and say we've accomplished it, we'll maintain our, our group of, of offerings, or do you continue to meet the demand and encourage the village to meet the demand that is not ever going to stop unless we are very unattractive? Well, you need to raise a crime wave. So yeah, I, <laughs> I think that the way the, way that the demand know. was, the way that he looked at demand was he looked at the mm -hmm. primary service area being Yellow Springs proper, yeah. and then he analyzed how much people make here and what kind of housing they need okay. and where the gaps are, and then recommended ways to fill those gaps for what he would consider a balanced market, which he's the expert on that, not me. But if I pray that we have the blessed opportunity to have a conversation that we have had so much success that now we have to rethink our strategy and have we mm -hmm. I, I, I just don't see that happening tomorrow or mm -hmm. even in five years I think this is a long term mm -hmm. strategy to create a incredibly stable uh, economic base for our community mm -hmm. moving forward yeah. I, I want to interrupt we have <coughs> And there's no reason we have to walk out the door, but we have one more, we have this shot, slide and one more slide. That's right. And those are talking about future. Why don't we look at those, hear about them, and then keep talking. Okay. So, um, but I, I did just want to say that I, I hear your question, and our, we're, our board is getting ready to have a strategic retreat to have new plans in January, and we'll certainly think about that. The end the big end goal that um, I think it was a long ways to go so um, anyway this project is really exciting it's using the new pocket neighborhood zoning uh, uh, overlay designation and we are delighted and excited to be able to have uh, site control of a one acre parcel it's in full development it's largely vacant along the high density 
Residence C Corridor in town at 1133 Xenia Avenue. Um, it's along the Greencast bus, bus route. It, we worked for many years to get site control of this property, and we've raised enough now in our capital campaign to be able to get to our first goal, which is purchasing the land by the end of the year. Um, we're going to create an inclusive infrastructure through the project, and it's going to be a mix of different incomes, different housing types. We're going to test some new products as a result of the housing needs assessment. Um, some next step homes, very smaller kind of downsizing cottages. We're going to have six rental units that are fully accessible or adaptable. Also some starter, um, some starter homes uh, for families, kind of a mix of things with the idea that we want this neighborhood to reflect the diversity we're seeking in our mission. Um, and so we anticipate serving people making between uh, less than 50% through the rentals all the way up to 120% in this one neighborhood. And we're gonna see what, uh, you know, what, what we learn um, as we look at other sites in the village. And as with all of our projects, we'll raise all of the funding commitments before the shovel hits the ground. Okay, and this is the other breaking news, which that um, in 2005, Friends, which is over a decade ago, Friends Care Community um, made senior affordable apartments a uh, priority in their strategic plans. And we have been working for over a decade to make this project happen. Um, in June of this year, after five years of efforts, we were able to get the um, funds on hand through the Morgan Family Foundation through a loan to purchase almost two acres from Wright State University across the street from Friends Care Center. And so um, that is a really big project. We don't have the capacity to do it on our own, so we, I went through a vetting process. Uh, we have a <coughs> stellar development team, including St. Mary Development Corporation, uh, who we picked because of their mission alignment, their track record of success, their ability to go in, above and beyond serving seniors, um, in terms of offering services to enhance well-being. And um, we're going for a totally different funding stream than we've gotten before, which is not actually taxpayer dollars. It is uh, equity raised from selling tax credits to private investors. So the state awards these tax credits. It's very competitive. Um, we are giving ourselves five years of going in as many times as needed to get the funding. And the first round, um, <coughs> that we will be hopefully applying in is February of 2019. Um, so this is a big deal and it would provide 54 one and two bedroom uh, senior apartments in a congregate family setting, wheelchair accessible with common areas, support services, property management, and we would be able to go up to 80% of area median income um, for this particular project, which is, we will tell you, in a moment what that means. I know this isn't uh, the final architectural drawing. This is a building project. massing that doesn't have color or landscaping mm -hmm. or anything. Yeah. But your neighbor, the Miami Township Fire Department, I believe, does not have the equipment to fight a fire on the fourth floor. They do. They, we have addressed fire safety um, as our, from the very first conversation and Colin um, has ensured that this will will meet or exceed all fire safety codes. I can address that too because I just talked to him today, and um, they they currently because of the hotel, um, if they were to need a ladder system, I believe it's Cedarville, Cedarville or Springfield would come out and assist. If we would have to. Um, if, if our fire department was going to go ahead and try to get a vehicle themselves, it would be over 650000 That's at the low end. For Very low end. Yeah. Right. And uh, that would probably go back to them asking taxpayers for that additional money. There might be some grant money for that, but he informed me that that's really difficult to get. You have to have a really good grant writer to get that. 
And so uh, what we did was work with the fire station uh, to make sure that we have a really robust fire safety system in place, including sprinkler systems, burn walls, you know, all the stuff you need to make to contain while they get the, the equipment there. And I mean, the nice thing too is that they'll be very close by um, to, and to be able to I have to, to say respond. something towards Emily. They, that he mentioned that they're working very closely with Home um, on addressing those issues as well. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, and would these be for purchase or for rent? These would be uh, rentals. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely sufficient demand in Yellow Springs today to fill every one of these units. I mean, we already have over 100 households on our wait list for the. Uh, and can I contract. just ask the breakdown? What I'm concerned about is one of the things I feel real strongly about is, you know, I. I get it because of grants and stuff and mm -hmm. the law, federal laws you're going to have to allow so many low income i'm more concerned about the moderate and high how many uh, rentals there's going to be in those areas because what i do see is that for seniors and you look as marianne said you you look around and you see what we all are we're all we're we're, we're, we're up there so um, there's going to be that need, even for upper level. And people want to stay in town. So they're, they're, we're going to open up, if, if the availability or if we look more towards that direction, my thought is, hopefully, uh, we're going to open up the real estate to, with our homes. Now, I've even put in my will that if my house the first priority it goes to a family. You know, that, that because of the issues, I know there's issues in here, and how we structure structure our community. So um, that's the area that I'm really interested in. Sure. So I can I can attempt to answer that. So um, so when we're looking at creating a a project. Uh, for this particular funding program, which is the way to get the, the biggest project started to, to make a real dent in the need. Um, it has to be 54 to 55 units this year. That's the, <laughs> that's our range to choose from. So we want 54. Um, and that really fills up the site. If we were to include some market rate units in here that were not um, income restricted in any way, it would have to be more than 54 units. And it, I, I feel like it, this is not the project that's going to meet that demand. But the tax credit rules changed and it used to have a 60% AMI cutoff and we're going to explore taking it up to 80%. And a lot of seniors fall within that range. Yeah. So I think Kanata has that pulled up. Yeah, so for 80%, um, one a one person household at 80% would be making $36,800 and a two person household would be making $42,080. And I think many, many seniors on fixed incomes fall below that, that threshold. Um, I, I, so it, it would not be possible to make to financially to do the project if we included some market rate units. Okay, well that's that's what I'm asking and yeah. at least I mean, we, we hear the need for it, and that's something, like, we'll be able to go up to 120% on some of the uh, for sale units on Glen Cottages, and we're very open to working with uh, market rate developers to do something uh, mixed income, but we're not able to do it on this project. Uh, will the electronic file of these slides be available? I can make them available. Yeah, that would be great. Please. Uh, and then Craig Meisher, local realtor, is scheduled to come for our fourth Wednesday in March. And then we had talked about having a panel on housing later in the spring, and it would appear that there would be strong interest in that. Uh, but you know, a combination of maybe some people from GMHA, Home Inc., the Village, Antioch College, right? Antioch Village, yeah, we're doing a series. And right. I think Antioch Village is a great example of a socially responsible invest uh, developer that's doing some higher end housing in town. We're very supportive of their efforts. Yeah, the college has formed a for-profit. 
uh, I don't know if it's LLC or corporation, uh, for their development. And we've been talking with Antioch too about uh, help, trying to help facilitate making at least one of those eight units affordable, and I think they're going through a process to, to do that. Any other questions, comments, input, advice? Yes. So I, I recommend that Don, you make the slides available to Don, and then we can bug Don. I've got on their website. Put them on their website. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be I know. I was thinking it would be really interesting to be able when we find out how many of that 54 people are going to, units, are going to free up other housing within the community because they're currently in a five bedroom, three bathroom home and they're by themselves. So they'll be freeing that up and moving into. You know the, the one so that's really going to be interesting to see how that ends yeah up we feel the goes. same way there's no way to predict uh, with assurance or certainty what that would look like but because there's so little freedom of movement we do anticipate some impact well, on are there going to be are there going to be like three bedroom units in this apartment it would be all one and two bedrooms we'll see it's unlikely someone from uh, house like you're talking about so going to go into a one bedroom apartment. I've got a six bedroom I'd like to get rid of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think I most think I, I think need. most seniors who have who can't go up and down stairs anymore, who are their families are gone, you know, they can't clean a big house anymore or are, are going to really want to go to a one we, I mean that's the new thing. Literally get into. calls every week from yeah. people sure. in town who mm -hmm. are either facing challenges with isolation, um, accessibility of their home, upkeep yeah. of the home, right. or um, affordability, and, cool. and either have to move out of town or like cling on in this very untenable, difficult situation until they're ready to go to, to friends here. Right. I mean, there, just, there aren't very many options for friends. In a, in a small town, just 20 mm -hmm. seniors right. who you know, have lost their partner, Family's gone, and the, 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 hanging on to all those boxes. Yeah, maybe we should start a moving service. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, like that's a big thing um, over the summer, especially getting to know the community. Was talking to people who I met a woman who lived on Dayton Street who had to move out of her place because it was not accessible enough for her. She had to move to Springfield, right? And she didn't have a place to go here. And so and that was before I was at Home Inc. So for me, that was something that was really personally touching. Um, I also talked to someone um, recently who called, and I and she's a neighbor of mine, and she mentioned that her daughter cannot afford to live here and her daughter has a disability and is wanting to know about Fort Spill Home. She grew up here. She had to move to Springfield because she couldn't find anything that was accessible and affordable. She wants to come home. So the you know these are the stories that really keep us I for me personally keep me motivated to want to make sure that these projects are exactly what we're saying that they are and they benefit people who who have lived here, who live here and folks who frankly, contribute a lot to our community. Excellent. Thank you, guys. We have gone a little bit over. I want to make a thank you to Meta and Emily of Caring Program. Um, Don, thank you again. You mentioned that we'll be doing the second of this housing series in March. Yes. Yeah, so look on the James A. McKee Association website. You can follow us there. And again, I want to thank everyone that um, came today. There's some information on Feel free to pick up some information and again thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you for doing all the work.